engineer here at SoftServe. And in my experience, I work with quite a few, well, very enterprise level project, and they also happen to be a legacy project. And today I'd like to share my experience on the working with legacy project and the best practices we may need or may want to apply when working there. And I'd also like to touch a few more intriguing, I hope, topics like the working with refactoring in legacy solution and applying of patterns in legacy solution. And yeah, basically that's it. Uh, and yeah, in case of any questions, please don't hesitate to ask them either in chat or at the end of each section and with that in mind let's start so first of all i believe almost everybody here is already familiar a bit with the concept of the legacy system but just to refresh usually legacy systems are the systems that have little or no code coverage and usually they also are created by quiet outdated basically all technologies and the solutions that were taken during implementation of the systems are usually not quite clear to us, people that start maintaining those solutions. And yeah, basically the main problem of uh, the legacy solution is the lack of information on what's going on and why it's going on. And it leads to a lot of different troubles here. The most noticeable among them are the problems with planning, I mean, it's quite difficult to estimate how much time the feature will take if you don't really know what's going on. And a lot of unexpected defects along the way. And yeah, uh, the one item I'd like to highlight here, it's usually not the one that is most noticeable, but it is important nonetheless. It's increased the security risk problem. With the outdated third-party tools, it quite possible to overlook the potential security injection. And this is a very important item to pay attention to. So with that in mind, let's move on to the ways of how to actually work with legacy solution. So first of all, our main ultimate goal while working with legacy solution is to basically improve it, to render in maintainable, so as to make it readable, first of all, and second, oh, and second important thing would be to make it unit testable. And this is a long-term goal. And in order to achieve that, we need to prioritize our challenges. So it's not usually a good idea to try and rewrite, implement, re-implement, improve the piece of code that is used quite rarely. For example, it doesn't make sense to pour a week, to pour weeks of efforts into rewriting and improvement a report that is being executed once a year. For example, some sort of inventory report. What we want to do first, we want to pay attention to the modules that are often used and what is even more important here are the modules that are often updated, because usually those modules are the modules where most of our troubles stem from. And by addressing them first, we would get the better, the best return of investment here. And yeah, having determined our primary targets, like the modules that are most often used and updated. Let's uh, take a quick look at the ground rules we need to follow while working with Lexi solution. And to be honest, the, the slide is here just to address the, the don'ts part of the rules uh, that, uh, yeah, that, we, that we usually want to cover in Lexi solution. The do part, we will dive deeper into the elements from that section later in the presentation, but for the don'ts, well, let's take a closer look at what we should be doing while working with legacy solution. Like the first and the most important thing is like, we can't just dive right in and start tearing down and rewrite it also functionality we encounter, even if we, well, really want to do so. Unfortunately, in real life scenarios, it doesn't really work. What we should do instead, we can implement a smaller, safer changes as we go, but we should plan very carefully for changes that are 
even a medium scale to say nothing about the large scale changes. The second idea here is that working carefully doesn't really work in legacy solution. What I mean by working carefully? We may be trying to uh, review all the dependencies. We may be trying to find out what the impact error is. But again, with legacy solution, it doesn't really work. It's not the best idea to invest into. What to do instead? We put some sort of safeguards in place, and instead of working cautiously with our legacy solution, we apply the same approach we can use in the new development techniques here. So first, apply the safeguards. After that, just work as usual. And we will review the safeguards a bit later. And the third, and I guess the most important rule here, is that please do not mix together the modification of the existing legacy code with the implementations of new feature. Like you know that idea when you start cleaning up here, then you add a bit of a new implementation on top of that. Then you go to the next area, again, clean up a bit, apply some a bit of new functionality on top of that. And yeah, it may be very nice while you, you are doing it, but Basically, it renders the code review process almost useless because it's very difficult or even impossible to try and follow all the dependencies between the interconnected code, especially with the refactoring and modifications being mixed together. So please make sure to perform refactoring as independently as possible or at least separate your code updates with refactoring as separate commits, again, for the sake of the code review. And yeah, now we can at least, at last, go deeper into the details from our rules from the previous section. Like what are the safe improvements and yeah, what can we do while just browsing, reviewing, and just going through our code regularly? Like the safe updates, we can improve all, we can implement all the goals. Those are updating updates related primarily to the formatting, to the cosmetic updates, and the updates that are limited to the scope of one class. For example, private members, we can safely rename, remove them. Well, of course, if they are not used, we can safely update the signatures and in, introduce any inline variables here. Two main items to pay attention here, like, yeah, it's obviously that the safe changes are safe because they are mostly related to one class. So it's quite difficult to really break something because those changes are usually quite easily spotted during the code review and yeah, they are relatively safe. And this is the second item I'd like to highlight here is the item related to formatting itself, like you know. This is a low effort activity. So improve the formatting, it's not something that requires a ton of efforts, but working with the well-formatted clear code is incomparably more pleasant in comparison with working with the original state of the code. And yeah, please note that even while the safe updates and small cleanups are always welcome, there are situations where similar low-scale updates are absolutely not welcome. Like, as usually, there is always a but in every rule. So please pay attention. Some exceptions here. First of all, yeah, I believe we all know that public methods are a bit tricky here because even if the public method seems to be unused, that may not be entirely truthful. Like, yeah, the public method that doesn't have direct references, the code can still be used as a part of some third party task management tool, as a part of the database configuration or in some sort of reflection based scenarios. So while working with public methods, please make sure you do not rename them to change the signature or remove them unless you are 100% sure you know where it is used and where it is not used. And yeah, and a few additional exams can be 
seen in this slide, but yeah, obviously the list is not exhaustive, it's just a few examples to watch out for. And all the other cases, unfortunately, will be, will be found by try and error approach based on the specific project you're working with. And yeah, again, a small tip here, please make sure to create a separate commit for the cleanup. Like it's not a complicated thing to review, but it does become a complicated one if the pure cleanup is mixed with some actual logical updates. And yeah. So if there are any questions at this point, please don't hesitate to ask them. But otherwise, I think we are good to go with more hands-on application of our ground rules. Like in the rule number two, the second rule of one of the previous slides, it was recommended that we do not try and work carefully, but we do create some safeguards for us to be more confident. And if for usual new development solutions, the uh, safeguards in place is a testing harness and most importantly and most often is a unit testing harness. For the legacy code solution, we would also want to try and rely on tests. The thing here is that for legacy solution, we cannot really create the unit test. That is basically the problem of the unit of the legacy solution. So what we do instead, we create a set of so-called characterization tests. Those tests, they try and capture the snapshot of the current behavior of the system. This behavior may not be ideal, but yeah, we do not want to try and tamper with it because it's the behavior our users expect. So we do not go ahead and change anything unless we are explicitly asked to do so. And yeah, one of the ways to preserve that behavior and to conserve it is our characterization test harness. So how do we create those characterization tests? Well, in the situation when it's, when it's obviously that we can't write the regular unit test. For one, we shift our attention from the unit test level to the integration test level. Most likely characterization test will be a high level integration test. So what do we start from? We review some business scenarios we have or just the basic rules of the understanding, basic rules of the fun functionality of the system. Like if I have some directory, for example, usually I do understand what users expect to get from it, at least in the basic level. So first I create some business scenarios. Second, I create some tests one several test per scenario that would describe this behavior. And then the interesting things start. So since we can't write this regular unit test uh, because the code is closely coupled and because we don't really know what the expected result is, what we do instead, well, we use the approach similar to the green-red development where we write the text we would expect to fail at the first pace. Right, so we just add some random expected result to our high level test and run the test. The test obviously fails, but on the plus side, at this point, we do know the real expected result for this test. So we update our test with the real expected result, we run our test, and yeah, at this point, it is passing successfully, and we have a newly created test for our functionality. We repeat the process for a set of scenarios, a set of tests, and in the end, we end up with a set of the tests that are more or less documenting the system we are working with. And at this point, we are more or less safe to try and actually start implementing some changes in our system. And yeah, at this point, since we are ready to try and implement the change, let's consider what and what is an update in a legacy system and how do we want to make it. Like as I mentioned before, the main objective here for us is to minimize the impact. Like we do not make an update unless it is explicitly requested. 
And while working with legacy code, our first initial urge will be to try and minimize the impact to the code. Like, you know, to try and write as few rows of code as possible, to try and affect as few files as possible, and uh, obviously do not create some new methods class, etc. And yeah, it may sound tempting, but in real life, it doesn't really work because the code we get this way is usually even worse than the code we started with. So our solution here is to actually try and isolate the pre-existing logic and the newly created functionality. So what do we do? We create a new method, class, module, etc., and isolate our new logic there. And what we do try to minimize is a number of connection points between the pre-existing code and the new one. And what we gain this way, our new code is absolutely isolated. It is testable, I hope, because it's a new code and we created it the way it is testable. And it can be tested, reviewed, and modified absolutely independently. Yeah, and yes, this is the basic approach, like the basic rule on how it is expected to be. And actually, there are only two real hands-on solution on how to really implement the change by adhering to this principle. And those approaches are the following. Like the first one is the Sprout, Sprout, Sprout technique. So what we have in the beginning, we have our old legacy code, we have our new code. And what we do, basically, we add a call to the new functionality from within the already existing legacy code. Yep, so we just add a new branch here, basically. And the other approach that exists here, it's basically, it's basically, it's basically the same by the other way around. So again, we start with the legacy code, we start with the newly implemented isolated approach to the, a new implementation. And what we do here, we call the legacy code from within our new functionality. So basically we are wrapping our old solution with our new approach, our new logic. And please pay attention here that both approaches, they work very well with either method level or class level. And if you're talking about the class level for the rep technique, that would be basically our regular inheritance. So we inherit the functionality and we override the pieces we need to override. And yeah, so this is, should be pretty simple and understandable. And yeah, to make the understanding even more understandable, let's take a closer look at the example here. Please note that we all examples we are going to have during this presentation so will be based on the same class and the same solution. The solution that basically implements a user setting for some rather large site. So what we have here, we have a set of tabs at the high level where we have users' permissions, look and feel, etc. We have some lower levels so that would be called categories in the code, I hope. Like people in grounds, the, lower, the next level would be the section level, and the final level will be a regular setting where we can either say yes or no, put and tick some value. Right? So basically, it's a tree like structure that is usual for most of the large sites. And yeah, let's go back to, let's go to our example. So here we have a class that encapsulates this logic related to the creation of that tree-like structure and provides the means to edit the settings. Right, this class is very legacy, like I did my best trying to replicate some of the best practices of the legacy solutions here. And yeah, what our task is with this uh, setting solution? Well, let's imagine we need to create a specific panel here that would contain a set of configuration for some statistical information in our marketing solution. Like, yeah, 
as a statistical configuration is not something we usually see in the regular yes-no format. So it is quite custom already. And uh, it should be a good illustration for us as a representative of the Sprout technique, because obviously we wouldn't want to try and add the same, this logic to this exact class, it would grow bigger, it wouldn't become more testable as it is. So yes, proud technique it is. And if you take a closer look at this class, which is well, pretty obvious in its essence, it contains the INIS method that would work with uh, tools visibility, like, you know, admin, not admin, it would be loading some tabs in a quiet, interesting way and yeah if we look a little bit further we would notice that there is already some very custom very specific method here that is adding marketing details like yeah as i mentioned before we are trying to add some panel with uh, statistics information and here we already have the panel with the marketing details so to be honest this method is already representative of this product technique implementation the trouble with this method is uh, obvious static dependency we see right as the first row, as the first row of the method. Like the repository that is loading the data, the static dependency. So basically, this method is not really unit testable. And this is not our goal, but we can still take a look at this method and notice that, yes, this is implementation of the Sprout technique at the method level. The method, new method is created and it's referenced from the existing code, right? And now, what are we going to do now? We will try and play with our Sprout technique using the class level implementation. To do so, I will actually use a fast forward here and I will demonstrate a new class, brand new class uh, created here for our statistic settings. Please note the solution we are working in is quite a legacy one, and it seems very much like a code behind for some sort of the uh, desktop Windows form application. So please don't be surprised to see some sorts of buttons here. It's okay. But the new class, what it does, it creates some settings. Uh, it takes in the statistics configs, displays settings for a set of configs and adds of controls in order for us to be able to edit them, right? And yeah, so at this point we have our logic being isolated. We have a set of unit tests created to cover this logic. Yeah, then the unit test should even be running successfully. And uh, yeah, so for statistic test class, we have two methods that are running successfully. And now we are ready to go ahead and inject this newly added logic. So we now have specific items. We don't do anything extra smart. We just add a new if here and create and call our existing class. This solution obviously is not ideal, but again, we already have static dependencies in this specific class. So adding a new one, it's not a big, it's the biggest problem at the moment. So yeah. That's basically it for the Sprout technique, like the new logic is isolated, the new logic is testable and tested, and the new code is injected at a single point into the legacy code. And now let's take a closer look at the other technique, the wrap technique. And to try and apply the wrap technique, let's imagine that we need to actually reuse our statistic configuration panel into another part of the solution. But that another part of the solution would require for us to have a different view for the admin level users. For example, the admin level users will need to see additional information on the last time when the statistic was configured and the last user who's been configuring the statistic. So what do we do here? We try and apply the wrap technique at the class level. As I mentioned before, the wrap technique is the class level to the basic inheritance. So we start from our basic statistic setting class. We make our data access methods 
virtual and we override it into child class right and here is our wrap like we do call our base method from inside of the newly created one and yeah basically this is it on the implementations of wrap techniques the tests are present here they are also running the class is isolated and is perfectly testable. And uh, now we are free to use either statistic settings or enhanced statistic settings in any part of our solution. And yeah, that's basically it for the demonstration of the basic techniques. And with that said, we can back, get back to our presentation. And if there are any questions of, on either technique, Please don't hesitate to ask them now. Okay, so let's move on. The final point of this presentation is the usage of patterns in the legacy solution. And yeah, I am not really going to expand on the question why patterns are so good like we already know that they are nice they are cool they're reliable and they're good for understanding so what do we do instead well i think the logical question here would be how do we actually decide on which pattern we need to implement in our legacy solution right and it's not surprising here that there are two basic approaches on how to decide on the pattern. The first approach is the top-down approach, and the second approach would be obviously the bottom-up approach. So what do we have in the top-down approach? So first of all, uh, this is basically the same approach that we are using in the new code development. So what we have as an input here, we know what's going on, and we know our goal, like for example, if my goal is to try and isolate a third party file generation tool, I would consider using adapter pattern or proxy pattern, regardless to the fact whether it's a new development or the refactoring in the legacy solution. So if the goal is clear, we can select our pattern. We are good to go already. So we select the pattern, we extract the related logic, and we refine the code. Please note that with legacy solutions, the boundaries of the pattern may not be as clear cut as we would expect them to be in the new solutions. It's okay, like here with legacy code, we expect the pattern to be a concept, not the exact correspondent to the diagrams we see in the pattern ex explanation section. So yeah. If the goal is clear, we are good to go. And please, while working with legacy solution, please pay attention to the names of the classes, methods you're working with. Why? Because it's quite likely that in legacy solution, we already have fully or partially implemented pattern, again, with the boundaries that are not that crisp. That crisp. And the, the names of the classes, of the participants, of the patterns, they may be quite telling. For example, if I encounter a class that it's called a wrapper or a client, well, it's a sign that I may be looking at some sort of limitation of adapter pattern on the same proxy. The same works for the handlers and processors. They are usually a sure sign on something like a chain of responsibility or server or actually both of them. And the second approach that was that is introduced usually while working with the legacy solution is the bottom-up approach. And this approach is quite specific because, yeah, it can be and should be used in the situations that are quite opposite to the ones described in the previous slides. Like with the top to bottom, with the top-down approach, I stated explicitly that it's required to know what's going on and what is the goal of our improvement. With the bottom-up approach, it's well, it's easier. Like this approach is, works best in the situation when you are not really familiar with this specific module, when you do not really know what's going on here. And one of the goals here is not only to improve the code quality, but also to get the understanding on what's going on. 
right? So what do we do while using this, uh, this approach? First of all, we <laughs> just take a deep breath and relax. We start slowly. We start performing safe updates, like we apply for medic, we perform cosmetic updates, like, you know, we create, um, we remove the field back properties, we add auto properties, etc. Then we just go ahead to rename the variables to make the names meaningful, we remove repetitions, we extract algorithms. And in the end, if we are lucky, we usually are able to spot a few themes around our regional code that would signify that we are actually working with a, a several single responsibility classes. Right, so if we review the steps one to three, one, one through three here and actually implement them, at the end of the step three, while you have all the three steps implemented, most likely you are in the situation when not only you have the code readable and distracted to a set of classes, but also you start understanding what's going on in the solution, like the specifics decision, the specific tweaks, etc. And this point, the point after the step three is finalized, it's actually breaking point here. So this is where you have to make a decision whether you want to add additional formality to the solution at hand, like go ahead and actually try and apply the pattern. In that case, just go back to the previous slide and use the top-down approach. Or you may decide to leave it as is. Like the state of the code currently is already much better than the one you started from. So that's already a win, a win. So just again, step four is optional. The main goal by working with bottom-up solution is to try and understand what's going on. And yeah, when we're working with bottom-up solution, we usually encounter quite well regular patterns like builder changes responsibility strategy like say all the range here but also we may encounter quiet and unusual patterns for example while applying the bottom-up solution it's quite often that we can encounter some unexpected patterns like command it's not often we would use them in the new development like not that many application scenarios there but in a legacy solution well command it's something you expect to see quite of. And yeah, this is basically it from the presentational part of this meeting. And let's get back to our settings class and let's try and apply our bottom-up approach to some of the elements of our original class. Like my target here will be the lower tabs class. Like you know, you see here is here are quite a few of comments here. I'd like to remove here. We can see quite a few unexpected flow of interruptions. And also there are a few quite complex and quite unreadable for that matter, linky expressions. So yeah, this is our target, our patient for today. And since we are working with the best practices today, let's get back a little and recall a section on the characterization tests here from the earlier in the presentation. And let's actually try and create some specific characterization tests for our target methods. Like, yeah, I've added a few rather obvious tests here like for admin to be able to restore the first like for user who is not an admin to not be able to restore these defects those are not even characterizations they are quite obvious they are quite obvious here so no difficulties at this point but if we start working with the load tabs method well it is quite complicated and since uh, here we have quite intertwined logic of the data creation, like UI creation, here we see some panels being created, right? And here we see some data being actually loaded from the database. 
I don't see, don't think it would be possible for me to try and actually write a reliable unit test for this method at this stage. So again, I decided to go for the characterization test and based on our algorithm, I create some random sets of scenarios. Here, I am concentrated only on the items I can actually track here. Those are the public fields in my original method that may not be the ideal solution for your case, but very good for the demonstration purposes. And what I do here, I create a few asserts that would try and monitor the state of the system from the outside. Yeah, so please know that the values I've added here are absolutely random. Like I don't know if the user with the default run would be an admin, I don't know what the title is expected to be for the static page, so I just put nulls here. And I can't even imagine the number of items you can turn in the main container after the run is finished. So what do I do next? I just go ahead and run the test. Yeah. And yeah, I'm, expected to, I'm expecting it to fail. And it does fail. It fails at the line 38, and it says that the real expected value here should be true, not false. So yeah, my yeah, my hunch was off, and the basic and the basic run for this solution is using non-admin rules permissions, and yeah. At this point, I hope that the first assertion here will succeed. And I'll just go ahead and rerun the test. At this point, I would expect it to fail in the row 39, because I don't expect null to be the real value for the settings title. And yeah, here, here we go. Like, we really have the user settings name as the title of our page. And if I rerun my, te my test the third time, I'm expecting to receive the items count value here and the item count value here is zero. And that is entirely unexpected. So while working with the code here, I will have I would have to pay close attention to the container main and the item configuration because it doesn't sound okay to have a zero items after running the default scenario for my lower depth method. So again, don't think that it's a gain from the testing perspective here, but it is a gain because it shows us the potential issues in the original code. Right, and yeah, let's get back to our original patient. So what we do first? Yeah, I will open all the methods for our class and take a closer look here. Like the first step is always the formatting. So I format the code, I add some uh, code convention recommended updates here. I fix some strange row configuration, right? And yeah, what I would do also, I would try and move the properties to the top of my class because it makes sense to have them there, right? And I would also go ahead and use, and I would go ahead and use the recommendation for the property usage because it does, because it does look user this way. And yeah, again, I would try and actually format the link records here again this formatting would be highly dependent on the code convention and the project you're working at. And what I would do next, I would try and rename the variables here, like category object suffixes with the uh, type name are highly not recommended in the recent years. And yeah, please make sure you're using some automated tool for the basic code updates because they tend to make fewer errors at actual manual implementation. And yeah, no, I'm not going to go through all the 
issues here. We'll fall fast forward to the next step in a few seconds. Here, this guide is just to demonstrate that the efforts that are needed for the formatting itself are usually not that big. So let's move on to our next step where our code is formatted. Yeah. And, 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 and concentrate on our target message, right? So for this, at this moment, I'm going to ignore all the other methods, but the lower tab one, right? And what we have here, here we have quite a few linky expressions that are, that are, as I mentioned already, a bit unreadable to me. So what do I want to do at this point? Again, small steps. I'm just going to create a new variable that would explain what actually is going on here. Yeah, my variable would be, don't really know what it would be. Let's decide on that a bit later. Yeah, I guess it would be a variable tab. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry, in just a second, we'll fix it in a second. So yeah, what we do, we retrieve the tabs here and those tabs that are expected to be a part of available categories and they are expected to have the names that correspond to the available categories and the tab names that corresponds to the available categories tab name. So I do think those are actually the available categories here. Now oh, those are the available tabs here. Right, so we create some meaningful name at this point we create Right, and we use those available tabs here as a part of for each message, right? Right, I hope this makes more sense now. Uh, and then we move on, we take a closer look at this uh, link request. We have a hint here that says that, yeah, we are about to try and hide empty tabs here. And it most likely it's what we are actually doing because we have the continue here that doesn't allow us to proceed with adding the category that is the tab that is likely empty. So what we do here, we create the variable that would say is tab empty, right? And we would extract our link request here. So if the tab, the tab is empty, we just, yeah, we just hide it. Again, I'm not going to proceed now with all the link use. Here I will just go, we just fast forward to the next step. Where, the, where our explanation is already added and move on from that point, right? Yeah, again, fast forward here and refresh here. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we have our not empty tabs, etc. At in this point, what I would like to do, well, I remember that the structure of our setting tabs is quite we like. And usually with trees, we start working either from the top or from the bottom of the structure. And uh, yeah, at this moment, I would like to go from the bottom, from the leaf level of our tree structure and start it, and try and start working with it. So if I go to the lowest level of our tree structure available in this method. That would be a category level. Like here we see categories from all the available categories that contain not only forbidden sections. They are actually built as a real nodes in the UI structure of our setting page. 
right? So here we have the data construction, here we have the UI construction, like here we have the category panel with square telling, so it, it is a UI construction. And what we want to do here at this point, well, I would like to try and encapsulate the logic related to the category creation to the category node creation as a separate mode, as a separate method here. What I'm going to do at this point, well, I'm going to create a method here in our setting class that would return some sort of the category node. That would be a method that basically builds my category node. So that would be built category node method again. Let's fix the name. And yeah, it would be taken in, I guess, the category. And it will be working with some values that are going out. I will create a method to lay the, the class later. So yeah, no need to be worried here. Here we are currently just creating the skeleton of the processing and we will return our category method, every category node as a result of our method. Then we add our expected build functionality here. And yeah, at that point we notice that we need an additional parameter that would be a hash set for the values we have, these are forbidden sections. Yeah, forbidden settings, sorry. Right, and at this point, we have a quite interesting element here that would break the flow. And since we don't have the for each loop here to actually be able to break out of it, what we do here instead, well, we would just return the newly created category node without adding any categories to it. And for the categories, we just use our node. And we would contain some data storage for the categories here, right? Right. At the moment, it kind of makes sense that we just go and use the build category node here. We notice that the categories count is being compared to zero, so it's quite likely we may get a lot of good use out of its empty method and the category node class. And yeah, what we do next, we just go to the point where we actually have that class and we actually have the functionality implemented, right? So we just reload it all. We see that the new build category method is fully functioning, functioning and it's actually being called at the top here. Again, what we noticed, notice here, currently it's quite vivid, that in this loop, we has both data structure building and UI structure building mixed together. And it's usually not a good sign for us. So what we do next, we just, we just separate them, right? So we will create the categories first. We will make sure that the categories we want to process will be added to some sort of collection, like, yeah, bar, yeah, then. And we will be processing. And we'll be processing the category nodes instead of categories here, right? Wrong. Yeah, again, just fast forward here to avoid any mistyping. And what we have here, we have the available categories, we have the nodes, and the nodes are being used for the UI construction. What we do next, we take a closer look 
with our data, we notice that our available category data is actually being used only for the data construction, for the category construction, and the UI construction can be separated here. Then we move on with uh, extracting the data on the category, from, from the data to category to extracting the data on the tabs. And after that, we may even go as far as try and add the root level dependency here, like to extract the whole tree configuration as a part of, out of this original method. So if we extract the root level here, right, our next contact point is the situation where we have some root being built, a set of built methods for the root tab and category here. And yeah, at this point, it's quite obvious that the data that the logic I've been extracting is related to the building and it basically calls for some builder implementation here. And if we get back to the load tabs method, what we see here also is a set of logic devoted to the usage of the tree data, like we construct patterns, we build nodes, and the logic that would define the main the main active tab here for our solution. So we just go ahead and extract all the lead logic. I mean, we extract the builder into its separate class. We extract the methods that are related to the UI construction here. And yep, what we end up with in comparison with our lower tabs method, method is the logic to create and call the builder and the logic to retrieve the UI configuration. And what we have additionally, it should be, it should be the helper devoted. It should be the helper devoted to the builder itself, right? And yeah, just to get back to that builder. Yes, sir. And just to get back to that builder, let's refresh our solution. Yeah, just to get back to that builder. Here we have the build nodes displayed here and input parameters. And yeah, I will write the fast forward to the way where we also perform some clean up to the original builder code. As far as you remember, the setting codes. The setting code we had here while extracting the nodes building, it we didn't actually change the original structure of the code. The left is at this, but we did update the structure, we did update the logic as soon as the builder itself was extracted to its separate class. And it was possible to actually unit test it and to see the dependencies like in one screen without influence of the UI construction element. And at this point, we can clearly see that we don't want work with empty tabs. We don't work with empty categories. And even more that categories we see as a screen are depending on the, some sort of avail available categories list for the user. And again, what we can see additionally is that the, some sort of forbidden settings configuration would determine the structure of the whole trees because it would cause our section categories, et cetera, to become empty. So yeah, and at this point, I am going to call it a day. So the functionality is cleaned up and the example is finished. The data is extracted and the builder class is hopefully testable. Again, basically that's it for the presentation. And in case you have any questions, this is a high time you ask them.